everybody. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Hi. Lovely Hi. people. Oh. How lovely it is to be here. Ladies, gentlemen, creatures of the universe, welcome to Ferguson Harrington Hawks, our wee podcast. Now, if you've never listened to this podcast before, well done. And if you have listened to this podcast before, you'll know that I'm Ferguson. I'm Harrington. And I'm Hawks, over here in the corner. Yeah. And we're here <laughs> live at the Edinburgh Fringe. Woo! Woo! <laughs> This is our last night, our last, uh, I say night, but it's actually the afternoon, isn't it? You're a showbiz pop star, you don't know the difference between night and day. I don't, I haven't slept for a week. Green M&Ms in the rider, you know. (laughs) Except Edinburgh, every day feels like a week. It does. I I feel like we've been here for at least two weeks and it's been three days. Yeah. Yeah. I need a nap. This is your last day here, isn't it? Yes. So, like, three days ago was it, it was Neil's first ever Edinburgh show. And now? And now, look, He's you're a, a now, firm a... professional. What do you feel like you've learned? Have you learned anything? I don't want this to turn into a bad wedding speech. Come on. <laughs> we can take it. No, I, it, makes, it, just, it makes you realise the guests have been fabulous, the audiences have been fabulous, or... The investment in us, everybody behind the scenes, the Corrins at Gilded Balloon, the tech, you know, Jeanette at PBJ. It, 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 I've just learned that everybody is so supportive oh. and it's been a great journey. Oh, no. And also, the other thing I've learned, <coughs> you guys won't know this, but Dave, who yeah. is Ches's tech guy and has been for years following him around, Ches can't even sing. He can't even <laughs> hold, he can't <laughs> hold a note. <laughs> Right? He's, it's he's all, up here. It's magic he's, trickery. He's here. honking away on stage. <laughs> Good day, he's pushing buttons and fucking. You it's know, so I've learnt, that's what I've learned. He's well, shit. Uh, <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. Everyone needs a Dave, by the way. Anyone yeah. got a Dave here? Anyone got a Dave here? <laughs> well, you should get one. You can't have that's mine. That's so funny because normally, that, I think that's the most I've ever heard you talk in three years. Because <laughs> <laughs> normally Neil spends his time in the cupboard under, under the, the cupboard. stairs, twiddling buttons and also doing music, don't you? Yeah. And He's there opened he is. Up. Like what do you feel you've learned at the French? Have you learned oh, anything? Just so, so much. I've, I've, I've learned how manic it is here. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. It's like a punch in the face. If yeah. art is a punch <laughs> in the face. It's all a bit, it's like, it's such a whirlwind, but I've really enjoyed it, actually. Um, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, you could obviously could go to a show every, every couple of hours and still and be here for a month and still not see everything. It's pretty amazing. But, uh, 180 shows a day, right? Is that, yeah. is 180 isn't it 3,000? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. we should really... What have you learned? What have you learned? What have I learned? I've learned that the... The, you know, it's more a reminder, actually, that I get from the French, which is the ego is the enemy of the soul. It's a bit <laughs> heavy. But you know, like, if you're in Edinburgh and you've got an ego about something, because there, there's loads of things you could lose your temper on, right? Yeah. You're like, don't drive the bus like that, or, <laughs> like, get me my coffee faster, right? Or, like, there's so many things you can take personally or get mad about, and Edinburgh just does it one after the other. So, really... Uh, I think you in Edinburgh just it just goes, you know, calm down, life, you'll get there in the end, right? Yeah. So it's always a reminder of that. Anyway, so maybe you should explain what the podcast is Yeah, we'll explain about, a little Mr. bit Hawk. about the po- the, this podcast. So what we do is we have a fabulous guest that we'll bring on in a minute, um, and we ask them for a quote, either that they live their life by or something that kind of means something to them. Um, and, uh, and in the middle, Lynn does a little bit of magic, which we'll explain a little bit Not later involving on. involving rabbits, no rabbits. No rabbits, <laughs> no hats. Yeah. Um, and then we also ask them for their favourite song or a song that has an emotional connection for them. And then I recreate it over here in the corner. Dave um, makes it sound good. And Dave makes... <laughs> <laughs> well, let me rephrase that. It's never going to get old, Dave you know that, makes you? everything sound good, <laughs> and I just stand there and look blonde. <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's basically it. That's our show. So, which, should we bring out our guests? I think we should. Yeah. Now, normally me, because I'm the gobby one, right, I normally introduce the guests and I go, right, okay, here's what you need to know. I'm mouthy, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to take that but off But of this you. time, I think you should introduce yeah, the guests. Yeah, uh, this guest is an old mate of mine. So, you all know him. He's uh, an amazing comic and, and an actor and uh, extraordinaire and, and also a very, very lovely man, one of my old, old mates. Uh, please welcome John Bishop. Woo! Hello, everyone. How are you? 
Got another podcast out at two o'clock just across oh, straight the Oh, <laughs> straight into the plug. Well, we've got a better guest than me. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you the first question, right? Because uh, Chez introduced you saying you're really good friends. And I, the question I want to ask you is not at all show busy. It is like, how do you cope with being friends with him? Because <laughs> he is the most accident prone person I know. Like, what, I think more accident prone than your husband? Oh my God, the second time I met Chez, he came to the front door. He came to my front door <laughs> and I opened it, right? And he had blood running all the way down his face. <laughs> like a big gash in his head like that, down, run down his face. And I said, you all right? And he went, yeah, I just uh, tried to close the boot of my car <laughs> and I forgot my head was there, uh, right? And then last night, just after midnight, he, he called and he went, I've locked myself out of the house and I'm meant to be speaking to the wife. What can I do? Oh, like, goodness. How do you, you've been friends for a while. How do you cope? Have you noticed his accident proneness? Well, f f first of all, where was the wife? Well, she's in LA. So, you know the phone you were using to phone <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. She didn't really explain the, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. There's, there's more to it. I know, right? Yeah, okay. so, uh, I'm accident prone. I'm not stupid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, we, we never, I've never seen that size of his You've face. You've never now. seen And that? bear in mind, me and Chesney uh, met on a panto. I really want to go. No, you no, didn't. You and didn't. I just oh, no. Uh, took no, everything. <laughs> I was sitting in my hands there going, don't we, see it. We don't. met in a pantomime in 2008, wasn't it? Seven, maybe? Two, uh, yeah. You think, seven, it was, you think it was eight, don't you? I, I think, think we've eight, had this yeah. argument before. Yeah. But. Uh, it was uh, <coughs> Dick Whittington. Chesney was Dick. Of course. And, uh, <laughs> of, of, of course. I feel Sometimes like you're picking on me today. And, uh, and, and, I, and I was Captain Cuttles, and um, um, uh, you know, it was one of the smaller parts. Don't want to ruin it for anybody, but uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, it was in Salford, and I done. I I just left my job. I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and I was doing a little bit of local radio. I hadn't broke through, and the, 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 the big names on the post was Chesney Hawks and Darren Day. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> John and Bishop was like... <laughs> oh, I was, I was amongst everybody else at the bottom. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and, and it was it was brilliant, because to me, Chesney was obviously like he is to everybody. Everyone knows me. I think, oh, damn, I'm going to be... A, what's he going to be like? I don't know many showbiz people. And he was okay. then, the way he always has been. Look, accident prone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just lovely. I've never, I've seriously, and his children reflect this, I've never known a more lovely person. Everyone who knows him likes him. Oh, uh, it's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> and just to clarify, just to clarify <laughs> where we were doing this panto, it was in um, the Lowry. Lowry in Manchester. In Salford. And, uh, and I don't know if anyone knows Salford, but Salford's a rough area of Manchester. And so what they tr decided to do, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago or more, they thought, this is really rough. This is an area full of gang violence and a lot of de deprived areas where people are getting into a lot of trouble. So what we'll do is we'll build them a theatre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll need that. Because yeah. that, that sorts it out. That'll it? sort it, yeah. So <laughs> basically, it's a beautiful theatre <laughs> in an area that's now been developed with the BBC and everything. But when we were doing it, it was still on its way to being yeah, developed. It was. And, and just to reflect how, how rough it is, they had to, um, remember they, they did a couple of matinees just for the local schools, oh, right? Yeah. So all the local schools would come in, and my part was Captain Cuttle. So I take Dick on a ship, <laughs> and we go sailing <laughs> towards Africa or somewhere, and then I crash the ship, and we end up on an island getting chased by a gorilla. I don't know how <laughs> how accurate any of these things are, but the thing <laughs> is, the historical... That, uh, yeah, so the point of it was to be that I, I go, kids, we're landed on this island, you know, do me a favour, I've been told there's a big gorilla there, we don't want to get caught by the gorilla, so if you see the gorilla, you'll tell us, won't you? And what you're supposed to get is the he's behind you moment, yeah. so there's me and Chesney <laughs> stood on the stage, there's 1,700 kids in the audience, and the gorilla comes out, and that is when you know Salford's a hard place because not one kid... <laughs> <laughs> not one kid wants Nothing. to grass. You know when... <laughs> <laughs> yes, are on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still there, man. <laughs>
There he is, kids. <laughs> He's right there. <laughs> Who oh, played the gorilla? Uh, or was that just that blow up? Was oh, no, probably Michael McIntyre. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, a, there's a, another story with that. When I moved into my digs in Salford, um, I'm checking in, looking at the place, very nice, and, and I opened the, um, the dishwasher and there was a huge purple dildo in the... <laughs> <laughs> My first day at work, the first day of meeting these guys, I turned up with a big purple dildo. Look, look everyone. <laughs> uh, there was also another moment on that pantomime where um, uh, Darren Day was called the C-word by a kid in the front row. No! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? Right, Sean. No. <laughs> yeah, it was. Because yeah, no. <laughs> he was playing the party. <laughs> what are you, you know, doing that stuff to the kids? What are you going to do? What have you got? <laughs> 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 I'm brilliant. Uh, was brilliant. So that's when we first met. We've been in touch ever, ever since. <laughs> but then, go back to the, the uh, accident-prone thing. You did actually utilise my accident-prone uh, stuff in the film that we did together, if you remember. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we did... I then rose at a... A TV drama oh, no. <laughs> about being in a panto, we based did, on a panto. Right there and then, like, literally... with. De- John and I were sitting backstage in his dressing room one, one night and he's like, it's fucking funny backstage. It's just, we're just commenting on how funny it is. Anyway, so carry on, John. Yeah, so <laughs> I ended up writing this uh, comedy drama that ITV did and, and Chesney was in it and it was, it was the t- play, it was Chesney playing a version of Chesney where the, where the panto, the panto operator said, right, Chesney, you come out, you sing the one and only, okay, you go off. And then come back five minutes later, sing the one and only. And then, <laughs> then you go off and for the finale, you sing the one and only. <laughs> and he was on crutches and everything. Get him out, just sing it, get him back. Do you remember you made me do that, that, um, uh, that stunt where I was in a wheelchair and my legs out here in the cast and my arms are like this. And then I came down from the top of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a rake stage, which means it's like on a... And, and I literally did the stunt myself, felt like yeah, Tom yeah, Cruise. Yeah. And, I, and I came <laughs> I came right, right down the front of the stage and straight off into the pit, like down into the pit. Oh, well, Forty Sheridan Smith, what if? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. You know, I, we should talk about the quote because we we are meant to do oh, yeah. the thing we, with the yeah. quote. And you have right a quote. Oh, sorry, right? isn't it? You have no, a quote. Yeah. You're not, why are you sorry? We're, We're meant to be, be doing it. You're meant to be <laughs> having a lovely <laughs> bubble bath of a time. <laughs> All right. right. Are you having a lovely bubble bath of a time? I haven't had a bubble bath for a long time. <laughs> why? Well, this you know what? I, th- I, I keep on arguing with my wife about this because I'm the man, but she doesn't like bubble bath, and I'm going. I don't want to buy bubble bath for me. If I buy it for you, can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy you some bubble bath. <laughs> oh, see, uh, it. it was your bubble you. bath. We'll probably drown in it. Definitely <laughs> <laughs> get some kind of injury. So the quote. So the quote. The quote. John, you have your quote. Do you want to tell us what it is? Your selected quote for the show. You, your quote. You mean the phrase? The phrase. Yeah. The yeah. phrase. More of a phrase than a quote. You'll never walk alone. Absolutely. Mm. So obviously that tells us so much about you. You're obviously a huge fan of the musical Carousel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big Rodgers and Hammerstein fan. One of their better works, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, ju- I should probably interject here. These guys know fuck all about Nothing. football. Nothing. No. I mean, no. literally. N- Nothing. Z- they don't e- she actually Until asked me the other day. I was talking about Liverpool the other day. And uh, she actually asked me, what colour do they wear? Yeah. That was just before he nearly I fell s- on the stairs, right? <laughs> <laughs> I told and I, was like, I, obviously I said it's blue, but, like, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, I'm obviously, that quote, Liverpool Football Club, and, and we'll get on to football and, and what it means to you in a bit, but I would say that quote, there's a, there's a sense of belonging, a sense of tribalism, a sense of family. So apart from Liverpool Football Club, how, yeah, how is that? Yeah, this, this is not... It, it's not limited and contained to Liverpool Football Club and Liverpool Football Club are not the only team that have sung that song and adopted it. Uh, but it, it, it's such a phrase that if you, if, you, if you allow it to resonate in your mind, it means everything. Because, you know, if you take some of the situations like the, the you know, Liverpool f- as, a, as a team suffered the horrendous uh, situation with the Hillsborough tragedy, and that, that phrase, you'll never walk alone, was never more apparent than, yeah. like, you know, th- th- the community 
we'll try and get justice for this because the system won't. Yeah. And all those people who felt so isolated had this sort of phrase that wrapped around them. And then that carries on to so many instances where I've seen it used. Yeah. And I just feel it's, it's that thing, you know, where, where you're saying to someone, oh, you know, you'll be all right, or, or I'm here if you want me. But if you say you'll never walk alone, yeah. that just says everything. Yeah. It says, like, we're with you. It's that phrase, I think there's, there's a, a post that you sometimes see in churches where um, there's a, a, a guy goes to heaven and uh, there's the footsteps in the sand of his life. Oh, yeah. And, and, he's, and, and God said, you know, I was with you. You, you. I was always with you. And he said, but you're saying that. But, you know, the old, when I was at my lowest, I look and there's only one set of footprints. And God said, yeah, that's when I was carrying you. Yeah. And you go, and that to me is, is, is like that. It's you'll never walk alone. There'll be someone there for you. And I think that it's such a beautiful thing to think of because if you take that on, then you're trying to apply that to other people. And for me, like the biggest weight that anyone can carry is loneliness. loneliness right. yeah. and, and it's the biggest weight that anyone can carry because it's the easiest weight to take off the back because all you do is say hello Support, and just yeah. say how are you and that is again something that that phrase captures do you think it means uh, you know more to you since you've had kids right as well it, it, it is but i think it's just age the more time you have on the planet the more shit goes on in your life and the more you think oh, no, that's that, that's when i got picked up by them that's when i got picked up by them mm. and it's such a great it's such a great phrase i think it encapsulates everything i uh, think you you embody it um there's a there's a lovely story here so um if i said the name sean cox mm. to you um it just sums up, you chose that phrase and then you, you know, you're not just saying it, you actually do it. There was a, I don't, you want to tell the story about what happened to Sean and the benefit gig that you put on for him? Um, well, you tell him. <laughs> 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 Halfway through. Um, so, so, yeah, Liverpool v, v Roma, three yeah. years ago, just regular guy on his way to the match and he was set upon and... Uh, yeah, it was terrible and yeah. you were straight in there you put a gig on in dublin to raise we, awareness yeah, and money for the he, family um, so sean similar age to me uh, from ireland and he was going to the game and the roma fans some of the uh, european clubs have these groups called the ultras who, who run around in black bandanas they're basically cowards and they just storm in and beat people up and whatever and they were coming down, uh, and I know what was happening, the geography of everything that went on, because my brother was with my sons, and they were within 20 metres of what happened. Oh, wow. These group of lads just came, Scary. and they were, they were carrying uh, big belt buckles. And so, the, and they, they would set on, on, on people. And obviously, you know, you're talking about grown men, sometimes your immediate reaction is to stand your ground, look after yourself, whatever, just, but they're coming out of nowhere. And anyway, they set upon Sean. He ended up with a severe brain injury that has meant that he's unable to talk, um, unable to walk, he needs 24 hour care. It was, you know, and he's got family, similar age to mine, he's got children, got a wife. And I kept on seeing it on the telly and with, the, you know, the Liverpool games to be a sort of recognition of what was going on. And then over time it sort of moved on and I, and I kept on thinking, someone's got to do something. And I, and I just thought, well, I can put something on, do something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I booked the arena in Dublin, the biggest venue in Dublin. And I got a lineup primarily of um, Irish comedians Jason Byrne, Tommy Tin, and Dara O'Brien, uh, Deirdre Kane, um, Joanne McNally, uh, Des Bishop, um, and Michael McIntyre. Phone Michael because uh, you know obviously he would sell anything else. And also you know what happens with comedians. 
you know, you do something for them, they'll always do something for you. And again, it's that you'll never walk alone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Here, you see it at Edinburgh, loads Definitely. of benefits, people helping out, and it's it's just a, a communal thing. So I'll put the gig on. Uh, my promoter promoted it for free, <laughs> and uh, we raised uh, over 300,000 euro for them. Jeez. Mm. So that, that meant that the family could stop fundraising because they had enough money to, to carry through his care for the next few years. That's, beautiful, that's amazing. I think, do you, the thing that's really interesting about listening to you is because obviously you're a very funny man, right? You're a very funny man, but the, the thing that's interesting about you is that you haven't sort of lost the sense of real. Do you know what I mean? Like some people get into comedy and they've sort of forgotten not forgotten where they came from, but like you, it, it seems like you've got both where you, you don't walk alone. Like you've got like the knowing of who you are now and the knowing of who you used to be or where you come from. And normally also fame does do yeah. weird things to people. Yeah. You yeah. said to me, yeah, you know, I've always been the same. Well, you've always been the same, mm. yeah. you know, and obviously since that time you've had a stratospheric rise and uh, now a household name and everything. And it, it can, it can it change can. people. Well, but I was speaking to the butler this morning and I said... <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> well, he was giving me a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, normally at this bit, I do this, what Chesney calls my little bit of magic, yeah. right? How would you describe it, Chesney? Well, it, it's, um, it's all about story, and, yeah, and we all have a story, story running in our head that may actually not be the, the real kind of thing that's happening. And, and uh, I think Lynn has... Uh, she's been working in story for, for years, and it's what she does. Get my book out, get my bubble bath, get in the whole thing. <laughs> it's all happening. <laughs> no, you know what it is? Is there's a story, I bet you know this already though, because you're very attuned to it, which is that most people are wandering about and they've got a story in their head that they think everybody else in the world can hear, but nobody else can, unless they speak it. And sometimes even you don't even know what the sound of the story in your head is, but there's a way you can find out you're up for it. <laughs> he looks very scared. <laughs> you don't know what's in my head. <laughs> I have a rough idea. We're about to find out. Just bubble bath. Mm. <laughs> Uh, I am going to ask you, yeah, I am, I'm going to ask you about your favourite sandwich, right? You're just going to tell me the truth, uh, wait, you're going to tell me the truth about your favourite sandwich for uh, two minutes, right? All the details of the sandwich. Just whatever. tell me whatever you feel about your favourite sandwich, right? Okay. You ready? Go. Yeah. Uh, well, the favourite sandwich that I have, I always have on granary bread or sourdough because I want to feel better than other people. <laughs> um, and I went for a long time being a complete vegan and then I got COVID and the first thing that I wanted to eat after COVID was cheese, a cheese sandwich. And then I realised that that was probably a childhood reflection of cheese and tomato sandwiches. So I, I had a cheese, cheddar cheese sandwich, with tomatoes on, and then, uh, and then mayonnaise. Now, obviously, because I'm in show business, I count my carbs, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm very careful. So I ate this sandwich and then didn't eat for a week after, because <laughs> I wasn't allowed. I was allowed sometimes to go and lick a rye vita, <laughs> but not to, not to follow it up with the second sandwich. But what I've always found from sandwiches, <laughs> and this is true, I have a passion for them, and I tell you why, I, nearly brought Subway to the UK, right? Nobody knows this. I got in contact with Subway when we were first married and they were run by a company called Doctors Inc. And I'd been to America coaching football and at that time they had one shop in Brighton, one shop in, in London and I wanted the franchise for the rest of the UK and they wanted $30,000 a oh shop as a franchise agreement right. and we just had a new baby and I went downstairs <laughs> and I said to Melanie I've got this great idea for a butty shop <laughs> <laughs> it's called Subway I've been to America I've had them the foot long sandwiches and I said all I need to do is to like remortgage the house get $30,000 for a shop and she just looked at me and went will you fuck off <laughs> 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 I'm changing the baby's laughing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and the last thing I want to think about is sandwich, let alone, let alone mortgage in the house so that you can sell salami butties to people <laughs> who don't even know what salami is. Oh. So, so that was me sandwich. That was actually, you might have been, uh, you've outdone yourself. I've never had a sandwich story that has been that mental. I'm okay. like, really? You nearly brought something? So to honest to God, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have phone calls with them. They were based in Connecticut. Um, <laughs> And I was genuinely looking at it, and I went to the bank. <laughs> and I said to the bank, I was waiting for the pharmaceutical company. I went to the bank with a little business plan. I said, I'm thinking of bringing Subway sandwiches over here. And the bank manager, I mean, well, actually, <laughs> let me put this into context. Where would this have been? This would have been 1995, probably. Jeez. So, so like the 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 looking at me as if to go what? And I went a foot long. The sandwiches are a foot long. And he went, don't be daft. People in the UK won't eat that much it's food. It's an American thing. Fucking, <laughs> hey, now look at yeah, this. Do you think that guy, that bank manager, is like the guy that refused the Beatles? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God. I could have had so much. No, money. you know what? I went to the same bank manager. Uh, to so try be to, a comedian. To, to, no, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to convince him to allow me to borrow money against my own house so that I can buy another house and rent that house. And he said, but you can't do that. You can only get a mortgage. You can only get a I remember him saying to me, you can only get a mortgage if you're going to live in the house. I said, well, can't you get a mortgage to let to somebody else? Buy to and let. he went, like, yeah. <laughs> and he went, no, don't be daft. So the idea is that I've had it. <laughs> You should be I running just, the country. I literally just Come thought, on. oh, that's it. No one takes me serious. I want to go on stage and talk about my penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, your thing is really interesting, right? The, the thing with a sandwich, it tells you about a person's tastes, right? But, like, what they choose. So, like, for some people, if you ask them about a sandwich, you know, people, there are people, the creepiest person I ever had, actually, talked about a sandwich that he got in Doha, where it was like they had caviar in it and they had all this like kind of rare stuff. And then he said, but you can't get it anymore because they have new people there and those people have ruined it, right? So evidently what he was saying was my tastes are I want special and nobody's as special as me, right? So yours, on the other hand, well, I like granary bread because you've got to look after yourself, right? Mm. And, and the cheese and tomato sandwich. Um, there is a thing about you where you're constantly keeping yourself in check, don't you? You've got a little... You don't ever walk alone because you've got a thing going on where you're like, just be a good guy, John. Don't be a dick, right? Yeah. And also that... Um, and it comes out as well in the subway thing, which is that you see the best things in the world as being simple. They're clear, aren't they? It's like a sandwich. Well, who wouldn't want a foot-long sandwich, right? Who doesn't like cheese and tomato? Like, things don't need to be over-fussy. They actually just need to be simple and clear. And it's other people that make it fussy. Does that make sense? The, there is a point where I, I actually said to my wife on the phone today, if everyone just did what I said. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, but that was everyone, Putin like, everyone, started like that. I mean, we've got to be careful. I think, just do what I'm saying. <laughs> it's got a Muslim. And, and if I'm yeah. wrong... <laughs> Then fine, yeah. you can say, we yeah. did what you said yeah. and you were yeah. wrong, but don't tell me I'm wrong before I've done it and then you do what you're doing, which I know is going to be wrong and then it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but also the thing, that when you see something as being right, it's simple. It's not complicated, right? It's not like you don't go, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get like a, a, like a clockwork mouse and then I'm going to get a firework and I'm going to have a guitar. <laughs> and then I'm, It's not that. It's like you go, it's a sandwich, it's got butter, it's got cheese. What's not to like, right? <laughs> that it's simple, the things that you see. Why wouldn't you give me a mortgage to rent out a house? What's wrong with you? Yeah. Right? That, that some people's tastes are... That, and, and I know it sounds like it, it, for you, because you do see th things as being simple, you'll be like, yeah, of course that's how I see things. But so if you, sometimes if you ask people their tastes, they'll talk about things... Even, you can ask somebody about their favourite sandwich, because as we're doing this, like, everybody will be going, well, no, I like the cheese, but I don't really like the cheddar yeah. cheese, I like <laughs> the other cheese. Like, everybody has a different story as to how it goes, and some people, I've asked people about their favourite sandwich, and, and this is a kind of weird thing. They'll talk about a sandwich they haven't had yet. Isn't that weird? <laughs> but yeah, I know, like, they'll go, well, yeah. I would really like a sandwich like that, but I'm not allowed. And I would really like something like that, but I'm gluten intolerant. And I would really like this, but I'm not allowed peanut butter. Like, they'll talk about all the things that they would really like to have. 
So what does that but say it, about them? It says that their, their, their tastes or their aspects are that they have to work before they're permitted to have whatever they want, right? right. Some people do have a thing about they're just not allowed to have what they want. Yeah. You, on the other hand, really are. Look, the world's really simple. Here's the thing. Bread, you got bread, you got pe- cheese, you got foot long. Come on. What's not to love, right? <laughs> Well, when you say you, you've got to work for it, you can have it. If you're gluten intolerant, <laughs> you still can't have it. No, I know. Well, but some, I am gluten intolerant. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Thanks for Are your you sympathy. Can, you Thanks for <laughs> your sympathy. You're the one who came up. If Do I you was know what? I'm gluten intolerant, but I have bubble baths. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but I tell you what, if I was gluten intolerant, I wouldn't even talk about butties. <laughs> it wouldn't be a thing I'd discuss. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, is I actually don't really like sandwiches. I know. Oh, what does that say about me? <laughs> yeah. Right? No, I know. So anyway, tastes, would you agree with me that you are quite simple? At, not simple. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you the bar. <laughs> when I was bringing on my friend, <laughs> you know, you didn't to call him simple. But also, <laughs> even, you know what, because in the quote that you chose, I really like it because it's straightforward. It's like totally, I've just told you, well, you'll never walk alone. That's what I'm thinking, right? Mm. It's not like you haven't gone, oh, I need to tell you stuff from Shakespeare or here's Albert Einstein or whatever. It's, and it's, it's lovely, actually, because it, it is a thing of going, I'm just going to cut out all the crap and tell you exactly where I'm at. Does that make sense? It does, but I think if I'm being honest with myself, uh, if you'd have asked me that quote 10 years ago, I might have tried and be cleverer. I might have tried and show off, whereas I'm more comfortable in my own skin now. Right. And things are... The one thing about getting old, like I'm sort of like I'm an old man, but I'm in my 50s, which used to be an old man until you get there. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. And then you go, well, I'm not that right, young, yeah. All right. <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, I'm not ready yet. And uh, and and I, uh, you just, I don't know, there's, there's a little bit of, you go, yeah, you don't have to pretend yeah. just be who you always are. But that also is in there, that thing about, you know, like I have granary bread, I'm going to try that, but I have to keep myself in check, but actually I'm just going to do what I need to do in mm. the end anyway, right? It's cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's like a palm reader of sandwiches, isn't it? <laughs> you know what, no, I tell you, it isn't, that, it's one of my campaigns about why it's not palm reading, and I get a little crazy about it, which is, like, if you're doing a piece of acting, you get the text, and you're looking at the text and you try and work out why the character would say what they would say, right? You're like, why would you say that? There's a the text. And when you're writing, you're putting down text and you're like, right, I know that this guy is really uh, annoyed about, you know, trees or something. So I need to think of a way to show that so that I'm not showing all my cards. Basically, it's just the construction of sentences to show what the story is, like the subtext or whatever that's going on underneath. And actually, this is just the other way around, which is you ask people about something, just say, what's the story about that? And if people don't think that they've got to be interesting, they'll tell you who they are. Because mm. most of the time you ask people a question, they'll say something that they think you think would be good for them, do you know? Um, and so this stuff is just really the, the kind of subtext. And so <laughs> my husband gets mad at me because I shout at the telly. But I go, you're a fraud. You're not doing magic. You're just listening to the words they say. Like, it really is just structure. It's not Mystic Meg. It's, it's not like always sandwiches either. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, okay. yeah. Like yesterday, we had diamonds. Diamonds, yeah, which, which is, is value. value. Yeah. I, do you know what I'm sitting thinking here? I'm going, right now, if I prove to him that it's no, that No, listen, I was, I, I'll be honest, I was expecting a card trick. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it matters. <laughs> The thing we haven't talked about uh, is that you were quite established in a different field before you got into stand-up, mm. yeah? What was that? What, how did you even get into doing that? I mean, did you go, oh, I want to be a stand-up, but I'll not? Mm. Or? Well, I had the sandwich shop. Did you? <laughs> no, no I, um, I, I, I worked in a fa- as a pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical industry. Right. So, in fact, I, I went past the... Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, it used to be, and I used to go in there because that's where the transplant unit was because I was re- responsible for a drug that stopped people rejecting their organs after a transplant. Wow, wow. So I was, you know, my official title was sales and marketing director, but in all honesty, you don't sell that or market it. You basically look for clinical studies and set up clinical studies and gain experience because it was a new 
medication, it was a new immunal suppressants. Did you like going places in that, in that world? Was that, you were like, had a, a trajectory, like... Oh, you, you very, could very have made a much. proper career out of it. Like yeah, yeah, and I was asked a few times whether I would relocate down south, and then and I, and I wasn't up for that, and then, and then I had serious conversations about going to the European head office in Munich, uh, I went to Munich a few times, uh, and you know, Melanie didn't fancy it, the kids, and so we didn't do that. Um, and then, um, and then, and then, I a few things made me go, "This isn't for me." And one of them was my boss, who was the MD. And I remember I used to have a call with him at two o'clock on a Friday, uh, and I got asked to move the call forward. To, to 11 o'clock, so I said, fine, so phone them at 11 o'clock, and we went through all of the, just objectives, I to, it, was, it was proper business planning, you had to mm. do a five-year plan, ten-year plan, it was a Japanese company, so then you had to go over and present it at different international meetings and all this stuff, so it was proper serious, so I had to various objectives to do, and I was phoning them up about where we were at in one of the marketing plans on our weekly call, and he said, okay, that, that, that's good. Any other point? He said, no. He said, look, I'm, I'm, I might be missing next week, but I should be all right, surely. I said, fine, fine, fine. And he, and he kept on saying to me, I think I want, I, I want you to be the person who takes over from me. He said, you know, I've got a few years left, but I want you to be the person that takes over from me, so I'm going to give you more and more responsibility. That phone call at 11 o'clock was in hospital. He was in hospital going to have an operation oh. for liver cancer and still wanted to do the call. Yeah. Oh. And I just, and he was saying, look at this, this is a life you could have. And I went, that's <laughs> fucking, that's yeah. not for me. <laughs> so, so that corporate world, because all of a sudden things do feel more important than what they are in the essence of life, like any job. And I, and I remember thinking that thing, wow, that's not for me. That's definitely not. But the me. kids were, were little, and you had uh, a, you know good money coming in, and yeah. I, that must have been a hard decision to. Or how did you tell Melanie that, you know? And well, and I just the kids sat, and what had happened is I'd started doing the stand-up comedy four or five years before. I'd done a couple of Edinburgh festivals because I had the uh, head of, who was the sales rep up in Scotland. I used to say, right, I'll come and base myself. In, I'll take two weeks holiday, and I'll base myself in Scotland for two weeks. And I actually this is sound mental now i was doing the uh, cellar at the pleasant right and every monday i used to do and i, I was on a half 11 every night and every monday i used to get the 6 30 shuttle <laughs> down to heathrow to go to the office what? to do a whole day in the office wow. get the seven o'clock flight back and then do, oh go God, and do my gig mental. and then do field visits for the rest of the week uh, going to see various people oh up God. here, and I, I, uh, but the work had sort of knew that I was doing comedy. They would allow me to do it, and then I, uh, I, I, I started getting the uh, sportsmen's dinners, middle of the week sportsmen's dinners, five hundred quid cash, but I did pay tax on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I started looking at it and going right. And I started looking at the kids, and then what had happened, people had started, who had been on the circuit with, had started moving off. You know, Alan Carr, um, Jimmy Carr, Michael McIntyre, other people, and you're going, and you, you could say Jason Manford, and I'm looking at their careers, and I'm thinking, I don't know whether I could do that. I don't know whether that's there for me. But mm. I know if I do these sportsmen's dinners, and I headline at some clubs, and maybe I try and get a bit of writing in, <laughs> I can maybe, if I go self-employed, net the same income. Mm. Um, and if I don't do it, the reason I'm not going to do it is I've got a mortgage and I've got three kids in schools and I've got a wife, and I'm going to blame them. Yeah. Mm. I'm not, oh, yeah. not going to say, I'm, I'm going to end up bitter mm. and I'm going to say, it was your fault I didn't give it a go. And I thought, there's no greater cowardice than that, than blame your own kids for not having a go. <laughs> so I thought... I sat down with Melanie and I said, I promise you, I'll make the same amount of money. And she said, that, that's fine, I believe you can do it, just go and do it, but make sure you make the same amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first year I didn't, and so, so we had to extend the mortgage. The second year I didn't, we had to extend the mortgage. The third year, it was like, I was starting to put, I was starting to put together packages 
of uh, renting the comedy store and doing presentation skills for people in business because I thought I need to earn some money in the day because this just isn't working yeah. and then things just went like that. Yeah. I always like that story. I know I've told it before. The story you, when you first told your, your kids that you were, life was going to change. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we had to sit them down. We had to sit, because we'd done ski holidays and all right. that stuff. <laughs> and, I had to sit, and the kids were in a fee paying school. And I had to sit them down and go, you know, all of that post school you're in, well, that might be changed. And all, <laughs> and all these holidays that we, we, we'd go. Because at the end of the fee paying school, because all the schools around us were putting special measures on the same day, they said you can go to any of those schools, but by the way the shit <laughs> <laughs> so, so we ended up with this big commitments and i'm like and so I, I, so we had to sit them down and he said you're gonna have to explain it to the kids that they can't expect some of the things that they're used to so i sat them down i said listen lads uh, things are going to change i think our joe would have been about 10 so it would have been 10 10 8 and 6 or so and i said look yeah. things are going to change and he said why dad i said well because I'm going to change my job and so that fancy car we've got is going to go and some of the holidays are going to go because I'm, I'm not going to have the money that, that, that we used to have. And, uh, but I think we'll be happier. I just, I just won't be able to give you all of the things that you used to. And he said, why, Dad? I said, because I'm going to be a comedian. He went, but you're not funny. <laughs> <laughs> How old was he? How well, fortunately, Ten. you're not my demographic. <laughs> 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 oh, well, yeah, like, yeah, no, I always loved that story. Was like, <laughs> what do they really? think now? Are they just like, he's still not still funny? Not yeah. funny yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, it's a different thing now because it's my job and it's my life. And, and, but it's just, listen, I will not pretend it's been plain sailing, been a straightforward adjustment because all of a sudden, Mike, we, we lived a normal life and then I went full time and you, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And so when the kids were teenagers and getting to know themselves, all of a sudden I was all over the place. And then I'm popping up on telly and then some people know them because they know me and they're trying to define yeah. themselves separately. So there's been, there's been times where if I could have changed anything, I love this job and it's got nothing to do with the, what you would call suppose fame or anything like that. I mean, financially it's, it's, it's a good job, but it's not even that. I love the job. Because I love what I do, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I love, I love the. We, we used to have when I was in, in the management speak is, is KPIs, K, key performance indicators. So you go, what's your KPIs for you for your sales team next week and all that? My KPI is hearing laughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I walk on stage and I say something and people laugh and go, wow, I'm doing my job well. And I, I love that, whatever the scale is and the size of it. So I love all of that. If I could have changed anything, I'd have maybe done it earlier so that the kids grew up in a more stable Secure, time. Yeah. Because then they would have known me as that rather than me being this and changing into that. But then they, I think that they probably, you know, got a lot from that. Oh, because, yeah. Because, you know, you, you, there's a brave thing to do that. Just kind of like completely right. I've got a job that's going that way and I've got good money and everything else. I've got the kids in a good school and I've got that lovely car. I mean, and then you say, right, I'm going to take an absolute plunge here and go head first in. That's got to give kids something inspirational. Yeah, I, I mean, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. It's shown them not get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's no, the problem. It, yeah. <laughs> it shows that you can follow your passions. Yeah, no, you're you, right. You know. Follow your passions. And I, I, th there is an indication of that. But I, uh, and by the way, I'm not complaining. It's been good. But I think for, for us as a family, it, we, we look back on that adjustment time as a little bit more yeah. adjustment than we thought was happening at the time. I think you and I uh, have that same thing in common, that love of what we do, you yeah. know, because I'm like, I can't pass the guitar without picking it up. And, you know, I just still, I still people ask me like, you get fed up with singing the one and only or, or doing whatever, you know, playing. I'm like, no, I, I still have the same buzz. Yeah. You know, I just, I, and it's... Oh, like here, I'm... I'm here uh, doing a podcast because we want to see if the podcast works live and all the rest of it, which it does, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right, plug in, plug in. But, it, it's, um, but I'm also doing gigs. So I'm doing yeah. four gigs tonight. 
<laughs> and I'm doing four, four little gigs. Wow. And wow. one's a room above a pub. Uh, I'm going to go and do the stand. I'm doing the, the, the late one here. The, the, the last... I'm getting on stage, I think, at quarter past midnight at one of them. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but you do it because you're here. And also, I want to practice and I want to get better. And amongst people who are at the top of the game. So you go, and right, it's the I'll fringe, and this yeah, is, this yeah, is yeah, what this is like the place for comedy. Well, talking about music, yes. look at that segue. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, it was sharp. So you good. That's why she yeah. gets the big buck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's <laughs> what big bucks. <laughs> talking about music, Chesney does his musical thing now. With mm. Yeah, music. well, let's have, before I get up there and do this for you, let's talk about the song that you chose. Okay. Yeah, you chose David Gray's Sail Away. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's all that? Mean? What a song. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it's a beautiful song. When I, when I tour, um, I got into a habit of getting off the stage. It's a funny thing, stand-up comedy. It's not like music. I don't think you'll have the same adrenaline rush. And I, I, um, I, for most of my tours until the most recent one, my driver was my cousin, David. So somebody I've grown up with, I've known mm. all my life, so I'm very comfortable with. And I can literally get off stage, get in the car with David, roll the seat back and be asleep in half an hour. Oh, right. And I can do that because I'm comfortable with him, but I can do it because I put David Gray on, right? Uh. David Gray, Grace and Stitch on, and I put that on, and, I, and, I, and it's, it's like a warm blanket to me, that song, that, that, that album, that, 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 his voice. And the reason is, uh, White Ladder came out at the worst time in my life. Uh, it came out because I just split up with my wife, um, and I couldn't be any lower. And I had a friend who I worked with called Melanie, and she said, have you heard this guy, David Gray? And I listened to the album, and I, and I used to hammer it mm. all the time. Uh, and that song particularly was so resonant with me. And then, um, and then fortunately for me, through a chain of events, which we haven't got time to talk about, uh, <laughs> I ended up getting back with my wife. Me yeah. and Melanie got back together. Um, and that was... 18 years ago or something like that. So we split up for two years, got back to, during which time I started stand-up comedy. And then, and then we got back together and I'd still listened to David Gray all the way through. And then about um, six years ago, I think it's six years ago, because of COVID, you can't count the time, know, right? can you? No. So, but it was a, probably about six years ago. Uh, we went to the ISO town. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. In, uh, in Sweden. And uh, I don't know if you know the ice hotel, it's a hotel built entirely of ice and they've got a little church there. And, uh, and we re I, I, I set it up, right, right. I, I thought, we're going to go to the ice hotel and what I'm going to do is we're going to renew our vows with the Swedish Lutheran Church, right? The <laughs> what? I don't know, he's, he was the fella that you can book. <laughs> he's the, the only act, fella, he's, he's the only act in town. <laughs> so, so, so you have to book it in advance. So I thought, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to tell it. Right. So, so, so we, because it's the ice hotel, we had to get like coats. On. coats. <laughs> we had to get coats to go. So I went to the coat shop to get, I said, let's get a new ski jacket. Let's get some new ski clothes to go. She said, okay, yeah, yeah. So we're there and I go, why don't you get this white <laughs> ski suit? And she's going, where the fuck would I want a white ski suit? I said, I just think it'll look nice, a white ski suit. She said, I'm never, ever going to go skiing in a white suit. I said, get the <laughs> Just buy the white suit. <laughs> so then we went and um, there was no one there. The church, as I say, is made out of ice and we've made the arrangements and the, the witness was the receptionist from the hotel. <laughs> and we walked in to this song well I um, I, no, no pressure then yeah. <laughs> and the other thing as well is i've got a neon sign with that sail away with oh you have in, in our kitchen yeah well just for you john bishop here's chesney hawks performing david grace sail away Sail away with me, honey Put my heart in your hands Sail away with me, honey Now, now, now Sail away with me What will be, will be I wanna hold you now Now, now For 
crazy skies are wild above me now Winter howling at my face And everything I held so dear Disappear without a trace Of all the times I tasted love Never knowing quite what I had Little darling, if you hear me now Never needed you so bad Spinning round inside my head, yeah Sail away with me, honey I'll put my heart in your hands Sail away with me, honey Now, now, now Sail away what will be, will be I wanna hold you now, now, now I've been talking drunk and gibbering Falling in and out of bars Trying to get some explanation here for the way some people are How did it ever come so far? Yeah. Sail away with me, honey I Put my heart in your hands Sail away with me, honey Now, now, now Sail away with me What will be, will be I wanna hold you now Now, now Sail away with me, honey Put my heart in your hands Sail away with me, honey Now, now, now Sail away with what will be, will be I wanna hold you now Now, now Oh, wow Well done Well done. Yeah, well, well done, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, mate. Thanks, mate. Thank you, you know, we were talking about Toya backstage when Toya did this, and yeah. she asked. <laughs> she asked him to do Human Behaviour by Bjork. Yeah. <laughs> she just went. And we should send it to you because it was. Brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. And he said upstairs as well when he was practicing. This thing about David Gray that I love this song, but I hate it because it's so complicated. But I love <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. The chord progression is like, it's simple, but it's not simple. It's like if you get one chord wrong, then you're kind of screwed for the for the whole <laughs> rest of the verse yeah. type of thing. Is that like, yeah? But it's it's a beautiful song, and I love David Gray as well. I've met him a few times. Have you? you know? No, I I actually I've spoke to him on a phone. Right. Uh, he had a lad, I think it was Rod or somebody, who was looking after him. Right. And, and I don't know, I got into a conversation, somebody there that I was, I was a fan. And he said, uh, he, said uh, he said, I'll phone him, I'm his manager or something. Yeah. I said, well, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> he him. And, and he was at an airport in Italy, he said, David, I've got you on Bishop. He said, okay. I said, I said, <laughs> I said Dave, I said, thanks for those songs, I really like him. He said, okay. <laughs> 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 Cheers, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else am I supposed to say? No, you know what I mean? I've cried on my own to you. <laughs> <laughs> I've sat there with a bottle of wine in my underpants. I think I'm one way wrong, David. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the daggers that I've got.
gone through my heart when I've listened to your voice. I'm not going to say that to him, am I? That's right, thanks, Dave. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. I have one last question. Go on. Which is, knowing what you know now, right? Because you said that, like, earlier on, that you don't feel that you've got anything to prove now. You're not, like, making fancy things. You just are, like, saying things how it is. But knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to, I don't know, yourself when you left school, before you started your medical job? What advice would you give yourself? Hmm. Uh, wow. What advice would I give myself? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm kind of happy on one level where I'm at, uh, but on other levels, uh, I, I wish I'd spent more time with the kids when they were younger. And I wish I'd have hugged them more. Mm. And mm. I don't think, I don't think any father, apart from him, I've seen him with his kids, yeah. it's like the fucking Waltons. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves everybody in our eyes. There is. But there is a little bit where um, I, uh, I don't know, I think, I think now, the, the, and this, the, the, this uh, I, I think, my, my kids are now in the 20s, and during their, their lifetime, a lot of communication between men has changed dramatically. So men are more open about the feelings, men are more expressive about the feelings. Now, I still, even now in my head, I know I want to be more open. But even now, sometimes I'll phone my kids and, and I'll finish the phone call and they'll go, love you, Dad. And I'll go, right, um, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'll let your mum know. Because <laughs> I haven't got all the tools I want to have and I wish if I could have changed anything I would say give them more time younger because they grow quicker than you think mm, yeah. and, and, and you'll never regret no one ever says you know my problem is I hooked them too much yeah, yeah. yeah. totally you know my problem was I was a bit more of one of those dads like come on just get on with it you'll be alright you'll be alright did right. that come from your dad? I think it just came from society, didn't it? I think it came from, you know, I grew up in a working class background and I don't think that's got anything to do with it because, you know, where you live is not... I think it was just the tools that I had in my box were based on the tools my dad had in his box. Mm. And there was never an absence of love, but sometimes an absence of Showing affirmation it. of Showing love. Mm. I think that's the way, the affirmation of love where you go, yeah. I'm always going, I don't need to tell you because you know... Yeah. And I think, how are they going to know? The six and seven yeah. year old yeah. kids. And you know what? If you tell them and they go, oh no, <laughs> it's not words wasted. No. And I think if I could learn anything about my life, it'd be that. I yeah, so lovely. hear you with that because the thing for me, this Edinburgh, it's not like the shows or anything, but my, 90, my eldest son, my 19 year old, his work in front of house for the Gilded Balloon. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic and everything, he's been a bit of a shut-in. And he even graduated, like, at home sort mm. of thing. And he's over here, and he didn't know anybody. He's American. We live in LA. And he, he's over here, and he was all kind of shy. He tried to start... He, he had a, for his 1.30 shift on his first day, he left his house, which is 20 minutes away, at 9.30 in the morning because <laughs> he didn't want to be late, right? <laughs> So there's been so much of him growing in this, right? And then he messaged me the night before last saying that he was going out with his friends after work. And then he sent me a video of his first drink. And I said, what was it? And he went, something fruity. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like the best feeling in the world. It's better than anything, anything else that Edinburgh can give me is that one thing, yeah, right? Where I go, yeah. I don't care. Do what you want, Edinburgh, to me. Because that kid has moved on. But by the same thing, I'm like... Oh, well, it's gone. right, it's gone. Yeah, he's not like a child bang. anymore. Oh, yeah, I, I used to do this little bit of me standing like I did it on purpose because it wasn't funny, but it, it was part of <laughs> but it was part of telling a story about having kids. And I said the difficulty with having, uh, uh, having, being a father of boys is different than being a father of girls because mm. when you're a father of boys, there's a day and you never know what it will be 
it will be the day that they will hold your hand for the last time. Mm. Oh. And they never come back. No, yeah. not from that. And you go, oh. And that's like, <laughs> that's, 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 no, but it is, it's hard, it's, it's, it's hard, but as I, but as I said, it's also uh. natural progression, because my boys are now like 28, 26, and 24, if I was holding their hands, it'd look odd, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> not like I'm grooming them, go <laughs> so, so, it's a natural progression, uh. but it is, we as fathers, our society has told us that your job is to emotionally break away from your kids, but it's not the same for mothers. And I think that's changing. I, you know, that change is a good thing. I just wish it had come 10 years early. God, yeah. I tell you, we could do a whole other hour yeah, on could. this. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. But good. you've got a podcast in home. Yeah, no, yeah, I've got a podcast in home. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's less depressing than this. <laughs> 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 this has been lovely. Thank you for yeah, this. No, you are amazing. Thanks for coming, man. So Thank you. We lovely. are going to have to close now. We will, and this is the end of our Edinburgh yeah. Festival run. Yeah. That's it. We're done. Thank you so That's much. It. Um, no, no. Yeah. But until the next time, um, for us here and the, our listener out there in the universe. Uh, I have been Ferguson. I've been Harrington. And I've been Hawks. And, and he, he has, has been, been Bishop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. You've been listening to Ferguson Harrington Hawks with Lynn Ferguson, Neil Harrington and Chesney Hawks. Written and produced for Source Productions by, surprise, surprise, Lynn Ferguson, Neil Harrington and Chesney Hawks. <laughs>